Although most history buffs and movie fans know how Hollywood has painted Katie Elder, the facts about her are far more interesting than what we have seen on the big screen. Before she made her appearance on Whiskey Row in the company of none other than Doc Holliday, along with Wyatt and Virgil Earp in 1879, her life is a story worthy of the movies. In the 1965 movie, The Sons of Katie Elder, starring John Wayne, we got to know one version of her life. History is somewhat empty of any evidence that she had any children except perhaps one that died as an infant along with the father. In 1971, she was portrayed by Faye Dunaway in the film Doc. Another of many versions can be seen in the very successful movie Tombstone, released in 1993. Well, over her lifetime, she wore many names. She was actually born Mary Catherine Heroni in Budapest, Hungary, November 7, 1850, the eldest daughter of a wealthy physician, well-educated, speaking at least five languages. Her father was once the personal physician to Maximilian of Mexico until he was rudely deposed in 1865. The family soon moved to Davenport, Iowa. And there her parents tragically died of yellow fever. At this time, Kate had reached the tender age of 14. She was put into a foster home of a gentleman named Otto Smith. When she reached the ripe old age of 17, she set out on her own, stowing away on a steamship that was headed to St. Louis, Missouri. But she was discovered by Captain Fisher. According to all reports, he was kind to her. During her young life, she suffered at the hands of many. But she took on the captain's name, calling herself Katie Fisher. She entered a convent under that name, graduating in 1869. Then in 1874, she traveled to Dodge City, Kansas, calling herself Kate Elder, where she met Nellie Bessie Earp, wife of James Earp, running a brothel. James was one of the brothers of Virgil, Wyatt, and Morgan. There seems to be a void of information as to why or when she went from debutante to debauchery selling herself to anyone for a few bucks, or why she picked Dodge City, Kansas as a destination at that time. In 1878, Kate is in Fort Griffin, Texas, where she meets John Henry Doc Holliday. Doc was in a poker game with a guy named Ed Bailey, a popular local, but he kept looking at Doc's discards. Doc warned him several times, but he just wouldn't listen. He got mad and wanted to shoot Doc. Well, Doc was quick with a knife, split his guts open, and he spilled on the floor. And Doc knew he was in trouble this time. Well, Big Nose Kate was certainly not going to allow her man to be hung. After setting a building on fire as a distraction, she headed to the room where Doc was being held. She knocked on the door and when it was open, she burst in with a gun in each of her dainty little hands. The guards backed off. Then she tossed Doc a pistol and they made their escape. The next few years, they were nearly always together. It is said they had a rocky relationship at best. Then in 1879, they made their way to Prescott, Arizona Territory, along with Wyatt, James, Morgan, and Virgil Earp. Virgil had been living in Prescott a couple of years before the others showed up. And it's ironic that all the principals 
of the uh, time, historically speaking, we're in this saloon at one time. Virgil, Earp, Morgan Earp, Doc Holliday, Kate, known as Big Nose Kate, not because her nose was large, but it was just aristocratic. And she had gained that reputation back in Dodge for having been a little too assertive for the post-Victorian era of women. Uh, Wyatt said she had a nature of putting her nose in other people's business and telling them what she thought and what she thought they should think. Well, after spending some time in Prescott and on Whiskey Row, Wyatt, James, Virgil, and their wives headed south to Tombstone and Destiny. Doc Holliday and Kate stayed behind to take advantage of some very good pickings. Doc had a winning streak right here in this palace saloon that was the largest ever in the state of Arizona or the Arizona Territory to this day. Because if you translate $10,000 in 1879 or 1880 into today's numbers, that's a magnificent amount of coin. And so when they went to pre uh, Tombstone, Doc and Kate stayed behind here in Prescott to play out that winning streak. And that's why they came into Tombstone about nine months later. Well, after the shootout in Tombstone, Doc and Kate had a serious falling out. Some enemies of Doc got Kate drunk and convinced her to accuse him of murder. She sobered up and recanted, but the damage was done. But when Doc was on his deathbed, she traveled to Colorado and took care of him until he died. She made it back to Arizona and eventually to Prescott, where she spent her last years in the Pioneer's home. Kate had never become a citizen of the United States. Legend has it that she persuaded a former <clears throat> client, a person of political influence, to make the proper adjustments to her records, showing that she was a U.S. citizen, so that she could be admitted to the Pioneer's home. Of course, Doc Holliday uh, at the OK Corral fight is probably the person who started that fight. And if there's any moral to come out of a gunfight at the OK Corral, it's this. Do not take a drunk dentist to make an arrest, OK? That's the moral of the entire thing. But uh, his girlfriend, Big Nose Kate, who was in Fly's boarding house during the fight, she witnessed the fight looking out the window at the guys actually firing there. They were later estranged, and she moved on to Globe area where she uh, ran a boarding house, and she ended up in the Pioneer's home in uh, Prescott, Arizona, and she wanted to cash in on the story because she was an older woman now, and she wanted to tell her side of the uh, story, and so she uh, uh, contracted a, uh, a young college student from the University of Arizona, Dr. Bjork, and he interviewed her, and they tried to tell her story, and they couldn't get it told, and she died alone at, at the Prescott uh, uh, Pioneer's home and uh, never got to tell her story. <laughs>